Good afternoon uh, to everybody uh, joining us um, in Europe and a warm welcome, of course, to everybody joining us online and uh, via YouTube for this online session um, where we will be discussing um, the ongoing reorientation of the EU and its member states um, in the trade, the high tech and the digital domains uh, with our partners in the United States and in other like minded countries. Um, my name is Maike Okono-Heimans. Uh, I'm a senior research fellow at the Klingendal Institute uh, based in The Hague, uh, where we have beautiful shiny uh, weather today. Um, and we have with us uh, snowy Washington, as I just understood, and uh, a dark by now uh, Canberra. Um, our speakers um, will be speaking, of course, um, not on that, uh, on the weather, but on their own topics in a minute. Um, most of you will know by now that Klingenau published uh, this report uh, last December on dealing with China in the high-tech domain um, with views um, including uh, those of our two speakers today um, and the uh, report was co-edited by myself and uh, my other colleague whom you can see in, in your gallery view, Brigitte Decker. Um, so this webinar is part of a mini series um, that came out of that report. And today our discussion will focus on specifically on strategic autonomy and technological sovereignty, uh, concepts that have of course been gaining increasing traction in Europe in recent years and that have led to quite some debate also with our partners. Um, the question is of course, is this a protectionist turn to Europe first um, or is it one element in a broader toolkit that aims to strengthen Europe's ability to deal um, or to deal with China and to act in its own best interests um, more broadly? Um, I think we will hear different views today. Um, because rather than discussing this between Europeans only, as happens so often, we decided to invite um, external uh, views and to invite also views from two practitioners. Um, who I will also introduce in a, in a second. Um, so in the next 75 minutes, um, you will hear the American view, an Australian view um, from Jim Lewis, uh, from Bart Hoveveen, um, and of course, uh, a view from our politician in the Dutch House of Representatives, Salima Belhai, um, and um, our expert from government in uh, the Ministry of Foreign Affairs, Peter Kotman. I will introduce them in a bit more detail just before they speak. Um, but to kick off the debate, I would like to just make three points that I think are important as we start discussing the topic of strategic autonomy and technological sovereignty. Um, one is a note on definition um, that's still very much uh, debated in, in Europe, uh, in the EU institutions and in EU member states. Um, so let me highlight three key elements um, or objectives that the EU recognizes. Um, I think these are important for all of us to be aware of. Um, the first is technology that works for the people. Um, this is sometimes labeled uh, the human-centered approach that the EU propagates. Um, second is a fair and competitive economy. So having available the instruments of power um, that you need to defend your own interests. And third is an open and democratic sustainable uh, society that defends and furthers also EU values. Um, key examples, of course, um, you will all be aware of, um, include investment screening, the 5G toolkits that the EU has developed, um, but also the supply chain acts that Germany adopted just this week, I think can be uh, seen in this context, as it binds companies to conduct supply chain due diligence against breaches of human rights and environmental standards. Um, and of course, this builds on a similar law um, that we have in France and the EU is to follow up with, with this um, by the middle of this year. Um, so, of course, all of this involves a greater role for the government um, in the market than what the EU and the member states have traditionally allowed, um, or at least in recent decades. So we can say with certainty that the taboo on industrial policy is now gone. Even in my own country, the Netherlands, um, and I think this uh, one case illustrates the shift in Europe very well, um, because just a few years ago, um, nobody actually wanted to speak about industrial policy. And now we are having this debate um, on economic uh, security also. So the shift in thinking is from allowing only uh, government intervention to deal with market failures to one of also allowing government intervention to correct um, the or to, to defend um, Dutch 
interests. And that is, I think, a very profound shift. Um, but what and where exactly then the government uh, can and should intervene as we move from correcting market failures to guaranteeing economic security um, is, of course, a very complex question, not just in the Netherlands, uh, but also in other member states. So as you can imagine, it's an even bigger question at the EU level. Um, second point that I will, would like to make is a shorter one. Um, it's about the need um, to put strategic autonomy in its proper context. Is it mostly about defensive action or is it also about offensive measures? Um, so is this also about innovation and commercialization? Um, and do we in Europe and with like-minded partners speak enough also to this offensive element? Um, are we eager enough to innovate and to do better ourselves to stay ahead of our competitors? And perhaps some reflections on what message Europe sent when the budget for research and innovation was cut at the last minute last July, um, as the EU and the member states negotiated their deal for the multi-annual financial framework. Third point um, is about the origin of the debate on strategic autonomy. So this is linking strategic autonomy to US decoupling. Um, because especially as we discuss the topic with our American friends, I think we would gain also from discussing the two in tandem, um, because of course, a strategic autonomy is a form of decoupling in the sense that both aim to reduce overdependence on China. But um, the US policies towards decoupling have also of course been a reason for the European Union uh, to move on a path towards more strategic autonomy um, because they are perceived by Europeans as very far going, um, unilateral seeking to disconnect, whereas Europe is not ready to disconnect. And also, of course, because they hurt European companies through their extraterritorial effects. Um, so while some steps on Europe's path to strengthen its own uh, strategic autonomy are certainly in line with US requests, we can just think of 5G again, um, others are perhaps not so much in sync with US policies, at least what we knew of them. So as we talk about strategic autonomy, um, perhaps um, we can gain also from uh, understand better understanding of the outlook of where the Biden administration is going, where big tech regulation is going more broadly, um, and perhaps also on the long term. Because of course, and in all frankness, many in Europe view the Trump administration um, not just as a blip in American history, um, but they are also bracing um, they're, well, they're first of all waiting, of course, what will come of this Biden administration and then bracing for what might come after those four years. Um, so with those scene setting remarks, um, high time to turn to our panel. Um, I would encourage all participants that are with us in Zoom um, to start putting questions in our chat and Q&A as we go. Um, feel free to um, already put your questions there. And then we go to um, Jim Lewis in Washington. Jim, you are Senior Vice President and Director of Strategic Technologies Program at the Center for Strategic and International Studies in Washington. Um, you've authored, of course, numerous publications on the relationships between technology, innovation, um, and national power. And you are also, um, you were the rapporteur for the United Nations uh, Group of Governmental Experts on Information Security. Um, Several reports were published, uh, came out of that. Um, so I think you will be an excellent um, person to introduce um, American thoughts on the discussion in Europe on strategic autonomy. Thank you for being with us, Jim. I think you're still muted. Uh. Then I'll say again, uh, thank you and hello to everyone. This has been a very valuable series. This is the second and uh, I attended the first, so. Uh, I congratulate you on some very useful work. Um, I wanted to talk about three points that you've raised uh, and that came up in some of the last discussion that we had. Uh, the first is um, some people wondered if the Euro if European success was somehow uh, bad for the United States. And I, I heard this from some of our European colleagues that the US did not want Europe to succeed. And that's just completely wrong. Right, uh, it's, it's in the interest of the United States to have a strong and economically growing, technologically vibrant Europe, right? That's, this is 
pragmatic, if nothing else, putting aside the ties of values and everything. And of course, it's it's easily possible to have political alignment and commercial competition. And one thing that you know the Biden administration has emphasized is the importance of allies. This is a change from from uh, his predecessor. Uh, but I think that the Europeans might also want to remember the importance of allies. Uh, and this is a long-standing relationship based first on culture and on values, but also for the last 70 years or so on uh, the pragmat pragmatic, <laughs> pragmatic need of democracies to defend themselves. So, uh, and I know, I think one of my colleagues the last time used a quote from Ben Franklin that we think of very often here in the US, which is, um, we either hang together or we'll hang individually. And that is true as we confront another spate of authoritarian regimes who appear to be untrammeled by the rule of law or uh, anything but their own interest. Second, the issue of technological sovereignty. And in the paper I wrote for the Institute, I introduced the idea of technological parity. Um, Europe has a strong R&D base and you see companies in Europe now uh, succeeding in creating new technologies in the Netherlands, in Germany. Um, unfortunately in the UK, I guess we can't count them as Europe anymore, but uh, there are powerful innovation centers in Europe in all the emerging technologies. There's dilemmas in commercializing those technologies and I would point to Brussels. But the goal for the US, the goal for Europe should be to see Europe as a technological partner. Um, sometimes as I was listening in the last session, I felt the spirit of de Gaulle hovering over the room. Um, that's not a good thing, right? So how do we build a transatlantic innovation base? Uh, it already exists. And one of the problems with the idea of technological sovereignty is the nature of innovation has changed. It's no longer national, it's transnational, it crosses borders. And if you look at how people come up with products or even how big companies do research, uh, they'll have uh, outposts in Europe, outposts in the Europe, US, outposts in China, right? So this is a transnational activity and the idea that you're going to return to nationalism, um, whether it's on this side of the Atlantic or on the other, just doesn't make any sense. The issue of Trump's return comes up, right? And so Europeans say, with reason, um, how do we know this won't happen again? Um, that's a much more complicated discussion. I would discourage easy assumptions about American politics though, right? And American history. Uh, there is, as there is, I was speaking to a French colleague um, a month ago uh, who said uh, actually on uh, right after the incident at the Capitol. And he said that it actually wasn't that surprising to him because it reminded him of the yellow vests who attempted to storm uh, one of the, the French government facilities. Um, we see a wave of populism uh, in democratic countries. We see a wave of discontent. And that discontent is the wave that Trump wrote into office. But um, Trump's largely been blown up. Uh, there's a majority, uh, majority being about 80% who would never tolerate this man again. Um, and the other side of this issue is have the ruling parties learned their lesson uh, about the need for social equity um, to be determined. I mean, ask me this question a year or two from now, but I don't think, I think that the odds of Trump ever returning are exceptionally low, right? The odds of populism in the US remain high because we haven't addressed some of the social inequities. Um, but that means that for us, from an American perspective, a strong democratic Europe as a full partner is our best defense against emerging resurgent authoritarianism. On that note, and I'll finish up here, uh, the issue of China. And it, Europe is still ambivalent about China. I do a lot of interviews with different European officials on this. If I was going to spin it in a positive way for the US, I'd say that Europe is perhaps two or three years behind the US and it's thinking about China. Um, but you're on the same general path. And the thing that drives that is China's behavior. We did a separate project on Chinese investment in the Nordic countries this summer. And one thing that came up spontaneously from our European interlocutors was the issue of Hong Kong, right? So Hong Kong, a formal agreement that Hong Kong would be one country and two systems. Um, 
under the current Chinese rulers, that has been discarded. And so, you know, while I actually think uh, the the agreement on investment, the co comprehensive agreement on investment, um, that's probably what the Trump administration wanted. So when Americans are critical of it, uh, it's it's it could be a little bit of envy, right? It's a good agreement with one caveat, and that is that China doesn't live up to its deals, right? You are gambling on the Chinese adhering. They came into the WTO and made all kinds of promises. You did not see them abide by any of them. They made promises to Hong Kong. You wouldn't want to live there now. Um, so it's a good agreement if China adheres to it. And of course, for Europe's perspective, there's a greater chance of China adhering to its agreement if Europe has strong friends. And that's not just the US, but it would include Japan, Canada, others. Um, we tend to overvalue China's technology. Uh, you know, I think some of this is age, frankly. I mean, the older you are, the more likely you are to see China as frightening uh, and the Chinese as technological super giants. They're quite good, you know, and we know that if uh, a Chinese scientist can leave China and move to California, he'll do quite well, right? Or a Chinese entrepreneur. And China is growing. We are not going to stop China's growth, right? But we do have concerns that we share, and that would be China's trade practices, China's commitment to a rules-based international order, which is weak, and China's commitment to the democratic values that we share. And this is one that baffles me a little bit because you know, sometimes Europeans say they want to be the exporters of a values-based system. Um, money is not the only metric though in your relationships with country, and you can't be an exporter of a value-based system and also be um, commercial partners with the world's largest police state. This is a difficult issue and there's no doubt about it. And I've told my American friends in the new administration, don't start a dialogue with Europe on technology by saying we need to agree to, to decouple from China. Don't start with China because you have your own internal debates that you have to work through. Um, we'll see where you come out. I hope you come out in the right place. I would urge it. Um, you know, finally, we, we have a tendency to put the word tech in front of any noun. And so you have tech alliance, tech sovereignty, tech parity, tech America, tech this. Um, take the word out and see if it makes any sense. Don't say tech, right? And that's where I think I would come back to is that um, the issue is not, technology is not a good base to build an alliance. It's not a good base to build sovereignty. The issue are your political values. The issue is democracy and respect for fundamental rights. That's a good basis to build an alliance. And that's where I think that I'm hopeful that, not confident, but hopeful that the US and Europe can rebuild their transatlantic partnership. So I'll stop there and we can see what we got in the way of questions. Thank you. Thank you so, so much, Jim. That's uh, very rich. Uh, I'm very tempted to, uh, to respond to many of the issues you said, but I will not uh, because this is uh, for other speakers um, uh, to say something. Perhaps just one um, where I would like a clarification perhaps later on was uh, where you said um, on, on technological parity um, and, and the need for Europe to do better on commercialization. And you pointed to Brussels. Uh, was that finger pointing or was that because that, this is where you think the solution is. Um, that's perhaps one thing that you could clarify. Just a quick response, uh, both. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thanks. Maybe we can uh, talk about that later. Um, and I'm sure that we will also have responses to your points um, about uh, the investment agreement uh, with China um, and the question of whether in two or three years time when we are, uh, we will be where the United States is today. Uh, I think some people here in Europe would disagree because of uh, some differences, um, but we're definitely uh, the shared concerns. Um, they will not change. Um, anyway, next to uh, Bart Hogeveen, um, actually uh, a former Klingendal colleague, I will start out by saying, uh, who is now in, um, in Canberra um, at, at ASPI. Um, Bart is now head of the cyber capacity building um, with the International Cyber Policy Center um, at ASPI, which is of course Australian Strategic Policy Institute. Um, you're also part of a network um, of think tanks um, and university experts across Southeast Asia. So you have close ties, I think also uh, with those countries um, and your views will be 
shaped or informed at least also by your discussions with them. Um, and just to complete uh, your introduction, of course, not just a former colleague, but also a former, uh, you working at the Ministry of Foreign Affairs and the Ministries of Defense here. Um, so will you give us your take on strategic autonomy debates in Europe um, and what you pick up, um, of course, of what the Australian government is thinking of it? Um, because you noted um, in your uh, chapter that the current state of Australia's technology ecosystem is fragile. Um, it's siloed, um, just as we hear oftentimes uh, said here. Um, so very curious if you think that there's some lessons for, for Europeans to learn, um, perhaps also from Australia's state and territory arrangements bill that you mentioned. Thanks, Bart, for being with us. Floor is yours. Great. Thanks, Maike. And thanks for that very elaborate introduction. Um, I, I just wanted to pick up on, uh, on Jim's last point that he was hopeful and one of the things I learned from my time at Klingendal and with the Klingendal Academy, when um, I think one of the Pakistani diplomats learned me the lesson, hope is not a policy. Um, so probably there's still some little work to make uh, Jim's hopefulness into a proper strategic policy. Um, uh, when we were waking up uh, about, uh, well, uh, 20 hours ago this morning, uh, we woke up to um, the fact that Facebook had um, blocked all um, Australian news uh, uh, producers and, and, um, and broadcasters um, from their accounts. Um, and, um, and, and this is part of uh, an ongoing debate, which, which, which could very well be a debate around uh, maybe not so much strategic autonomy, but about uh, uh, strengthening auto autonomous capabilities um, in, in the technology space. Um, and one of um, one of the colleagues here at the Australian National University said, well, there was first China, there's now Facebook, Australia is getting used to counterproductive behavior from unaccountable giants, either states or tech giants. Um, and as many of you will know that kind of the, the government to government relations between uh, Beijing and Canberra are, are at the moment pretty poor and, and antagonistic. Um, and, and I think that's I'm just saying that because I think it, it shapes the context in which um, Australia uh, obviously deals um, uh, with China, but also how it sees its uh, its partnerships with uh, with Europe and, and with the US. So those are kind of the three angles I would like to touch on quite uh, uh, briefly in the, in, in the introduction. Um, um, so so uh, let's say in, in this in this space around uh, tech diplomacy and. Sorry, Jim. Uh, tech diplomacy um, um, uh, by, by the Australian government, in particular, uh, has, has really gained uh, tremendous prominence over the last last couple of years. Um, and I think it's also been recognised um, uh, externally. Um, we've we've seen over the last couple of years numerous visitors, including from from uh, from Europe, who really like to see and hear uh, how Australia is. Um, is, is dealing with uh, a very fragile regional uh, uh, political and security um, climate um, and with strong war for technology. And even uh, Prime Minister Rutter was here, I think, in September 2019. I'm not sure whether Mr. Popman was accompanying him at the time, um, because I think, I think that's one of the, maybe the only uh, or, or one of the very few foreign policy speeches that, um, that the Dutch Prime Minister, I think, ever uh, ever produced uh, here in Australia, and that's oftentimes a very safe place because no one really notices if, if that's happening here. Um, but uh, uh, worth uh, rereading if you have a chance. Um, talking about um, um, strategic uh, autonomy, um, which is not so much a term that, that you hear too much uh, here. Um, uh, um, um, and I think, I think there, are, there are a number of reasons for that, and I'll, I'll touch on that. Um, obviously, um, um, we've seen that, I mean, obviously, Australia is in a very different position um, in contrast to the US and, and Europe, and that's partly just because of its geo, uh, geographic location, it is vulnerable to, um, uh, for, to, to supply chain risks and, and security to supply chains. Um, for instance, we only received our first batch of vaccines this week, um, that's even a month later than, than, uh, than, than in Europe uh, by ship. Um, so um, there's definitely a, a very uh, a very articulated uh, need for us to uh, pr protect uh, the economy, which is uh, also more dependent uh, on China. And I think 
uh, the Klingler Institute just produced a nice map of, of the Belt and Road Initiative today, which clearly shows that Australia, of the China is for Australia uh, the, 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 the first export market. Um, so there is a very clear dependency relationship there, more so than in the US and more so than in most European countries. Um, that brings me to the point, let's say, whether uh, how, 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 how Australia kind of looks at um, the region and its partnership with, with China, with Europe, and, and with the US. Um, and I think I totally agree with what you mentioned, is that um, there is a clear interest for Australia as well for a strong Europe. Um, who wouldn't want a strong Europe that, uh, in particular, um, uh, promoting kind of like-minded values and norms um, in, in, in cyber issues and technology issues and around democratic issues around the world. But I don't think it's only about, let's say, strongness. It's also uh, about um, constructiveness and being a responsible actor. Um, and I think there, um, although um, similar to the transatlantic relationship um, uh, on your side of the world, the relationship between the US and Australia is extremely strong. But the relationship with China is also very important. And I think even though the relations are very poor at the moment, you, 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 you see that, that, let's say, leading politicians and ministers are trying to open the dialogue again um, where possible and, and trying to rearticulate that um, any big power that is strong, but also constructive and responsible and promotes an open, free and rules-based international order, in particular in, in the Pacific, um, it's welcome. And that also goes for kind of the the, um, the, uh, the 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 technology space. Um, so uh, um, and and in, in my in my in my contribution to um, to the report, um, I uh, I try to look a, a little bit into um, as Mike uh, explained into the, the different categories of uh, of what con what is considered technology uh, or high technology. Uh, so you talked about let's say defensive measures, offensive measures, and and I added something around kind of sub, uh, uh, around diplomacy. And I think if you look at defensive measures, it's remarkable how much um, Australian regulations and laws have followed um, the U.S. Um, there is so much overlap between the measures taken uh, uh, by U.S. lawmakers and how that has um, has been translated into um, local legislation here. With one exception, um, and Canberra tends to be very proud of that, is that um, they, they kind of started the whole Huawei and 5G debate, uh, which informed uh, decision-making by Washington in their views at least, um, and which then also uh, led to kind of uh, a, probably a change of opinion in, in, in many European capitals. But on the offensive side, and I'm not sure whether offensive is a very uh, fortunate word there, but when we're looking at innovation, research and development and a kind of technology export market. That's, I think, where Australia finds itself in a slightly different position and maybe also a bit more anxious about developments around de decoupling and strategic autonomy because we are, let's say, a relatively small market. Um, and as you mentioned, the, the, the domestic technology and innovation space is, is fairly fragile. Um, people classify a country like Australia as a technology taker rather than as a technology shaper. Um, and that needs to change, and that there is a recognition of that change to be needed in order to be a credible and constructive partner in the technology debate. Whether that's feasible because of the small market and because of kind of the current geopolitical situation, I think that's that's the next question. But if strategic autonomy is going to mean that there will be decoupling, decoupling between the U.S. and China, between Europe and China, um, and and let's say stronger barriers to the European internal market. Um, that that would, I think, generally not be uh, looked up very positively from, from this side of the world because the export market is um, so incredibly important. Um, um, the final point I wanted to just raise is, let's say, how a relatively small nation, or as they call themselves here, middle power is kind of using its diplomatic tools to start to hopefully shape uh, the debate around technology uh, very much kind of in, in United Nations forums um, that Jim has been so uh, uh, intimately part of, um, but also in, in, in working with, um, with, with many, many lateral coalitions, in particular the Quad, which has gained prominence um, in the last, let's say, year or two. Um, so the coalition between the US, India, Japan and Australia as kind of the, the four democratic nations in the region, and that has now um, gotten a very strong kind of technology chapter to it. Um, um, with increased cooperation between the four nations to uh, support export, but also export markets, but also to start to shape the international debate around 
technical standards and, and things like that. Um, um, so, so, so I think that's kind of, let's say, um, um, a bit of a context to the Australian situation. Uh, Mike, the final point uh, you brought up um, um, for me to, to, to talk about was, uh, let's say, our, some of our internal arrangements, let's say the internal governance arrangement. Um, and there have been two very prominent cases of, uh, so Australia is a federa federal state, similar to the US, where um, the individual states have the right to enter into foreign agreements, um, um, let's say on their on their own right, and that has happened with with two states in Victoria and in um, with the Northern Territories, where key um, the Northern Territories where Key Harbour was leased to a Chinese company, um, and the Northern Territories is a key kind of uh, hub for the Australian Navy, um, which caused lots of criticism, um, and more recently the Victorian government uh, made a similar arrangement to join um, the, uh, the Belt and Road Initiative. And that has now caused a new law that was that was enacted uh, maybe two months ago, um, where that prerogative of the states and territories was um, um, was, uh, was 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 cut off, cut off, and uh, and now um, being put let's say under the central uh, uh, um, control of the foreign minister to override um, certain arrangements. And I see there a similarity, I think, with the European Union, where individual states have taken a much more Kind of forward-leaning approach to coll collaborating with um, uh, with China, China and Chinese tech companies, uh, maybe uh, not entirely in line with either the the direction set by Brussels or or let's say representing um, a a consensus view from uh, from the, the 27 member states. I'll leave it at that. Thanks. Thank you so much, uh, Bart. And uh, indeed, some of the complexities that we see here in Europe with the, the two-level game, uh, some people uh, called it, um, is of course not just for Europe. So there's definitely uh, well interest in, I think, exchanging um, or learning from best practices uh, from one another. Um, thank you so much. Um, again, I'm sure that there will be uh, the questions uh, put uh, to you in the uh, in the chat soon. Um, and I would like to encourage again all our participants to really do so as we speak. Um, but before we get to the questions, of course, uh, we will now invite two Dutch uh, views. Um, uh, as I said, one from the House of Representatives, uh, where Ms. Salima Belhai has been uh, working for the past uh, five years now um, for the, the Liberal Progressive Party, Democrat 66. Um, she has served in the, uh, well, she's hoping, of course, to continue her work, uh, I believe, mm. after the uh, elections that we have upcoming here next month. Um, and she has been the spokesperson uh, for defense, um, a member of the Foreign Affairs Committee, uh, vice president of the Committee on European Affairs. Um, and I believe on high tech and geopolitics, um, you have pledged Salima uh, for more control and caution regarding high tech warfare um, and European solutions um, on technology and geopolitics. Um, and rather recently, um, your own party even published, was it called the Attack Vision? Um, that I'm sure will be uh, the basis also for your input. The uh, floor is yours. Uh, Salima, glad to have you here. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, this is, uh, I think, the first time since the campaign started, I find it myself relaxed and more in a different uh, energy uh, level uh, talking about politics. I will give a, a short uh, view. Of course, it's a view from our political party, but I think uh, it could be interesting for, for the debate. Um, like being uh, already said and noted in, uh, in the papers is that China is a rising superpower and set to overtake the economy of the United States. Um, this raises the question how European nations should position themselves in this global fight for supremacy. The transatlantic relationship has been under pressure during the Trump administration, but remains strong. However, Europe nations should not carelessly follow the Biden administration regarding China. European nations united in the European Union should develop their own political, economic and security stance with respect to China. Therefore, we believe or we embrace the move of the European Commission for more strategic autonomy and a new strategic and geopolitical course that is decoupled from the United States. To be sure, of course, the United States is still our big brother, best ally in the NATO and is still the way to, uh, to guarantee uh, uh, our security. 
However, the EU should come back from its geopolitical holiday, as I would call it, and strive to become its own economic, political and defensive superpower. Uh, D66 vouches for an equivalent and realistic position towards China, taking the European Union as a starting point, not the individual nation state. I will make there a further remark um, about uh, why it's so difficult also from the Dutch perspective. Uh, with regard to high technology, there are several issues to address and there's a lot of work to be done. I will only address two main problems that we uh, identify and uh, will also reflect on what what been said before. Um, and uh, first, uh, I would like to start with the role of 5G technology and the possible uh, Chinese access to our critical uh, digital infrastructure. Uh, this requires a uh, political stance in the EU. However, it does, it does, that, that doesn't seem to go that way with Germany and Belgium allowing Hawaii. Dutch, color, Dutch telecom provider KPN started using Huawei attends as well. Our strategy um, should be the EU should develop a directive for safety protocols regarding cyber security, operational security, physical security, and data security for companies that work with communication technologies, networks, and the Internet of Things devices. The EU should heavily invest in innovation and technology companies to try and keep up with the Chinese. Uh, my colleague, uh, Kees Verhoeven, MOP, has uh, suggested already to invest 50 billion euros in technology. The EU should change competition law to make it possible developing an own European tech uh, champion. Tech startups should get more space in the EU innovation, innovation sphere. Second problem, or I would like to address, and I'm um, curious uh, for, for debate after uh, that, is about intellectual property and espionage. By means of digital company espionage and forced transfer, transfer of technology through unequal trade deals, Chinese companies are first copying European technology and subsequently bringing it back on EU markets for lower prices. There are diverse uh, examples. Um, what, what we think you should do, or we should do, is my responsibility for politics, but we're not alone, is that the EU should make haste with uh, the uh, exchange of information and intelligence about espionage and digital theft. The EU should make EU legislation to be able to sanction companies that are setting, selling technologies on the EU market after digital theft or obstruction of EP, EP rights. Uh, the EU could use the Bagninsky sanction regime. Um, the EU should also next to important screening develop an export screening for sensitive technologies and high-tech IT products. And um, also we believe that the EU and the Netherlands should take the initiative to establish an international organization for independent investigation into possible cases of cyber attacks. Um, I can see that my time is almost up but otherwise uh, you will tell me, but I will round up. Um, uh, if the European Union does not step uh, in, this, in his United game concerning high-tech companies, and if it does not start funding European innovative spheres, it will be completely overruled in the new digital economy. So right now there are 11 American companies and nine Chinese companies in the top 20 internet companies. There are zero European ones. The time is now for a European tech strategy. Sorry for the word tech. The clock uh, is thinking, uh, is ticking. The EU already lost the battle for the internet or better said, we never participated. We need to jump on the bandwagon of the digital revolution to make sure that the EU does not lose its current economic and political position in the world. In other words, to remain uh, the current state of welfare and well-being for its citizens, um, it's a, it's an importance. Um, and um, I would like to make an extra remark that it's really difficult to talk about the European Union in a sense that you want to be to have more cooperation because in the Netherlands there are not a lot of uh, your, uh, political parties who like that debate. Uh, of course, we debated a lot of, about uh, a common security and uh, foreign policy. It's really difficult because um, the nationalistic uh, wind is also uh, flowing through the Netherlands. So you can imagine how difficult it is 
um, talking about a really a strategic uh, autonomy in the EU and also the all the aspects I just mentioned. I hope it was short enough. Mike. Concise and to the point. Thank you very much, uh, Salima, also for uh, for bringing in very specific uh, suggestions and ideas on on the various subsets of, of that big um, theme of uh, of strategic autonomy. I think it's very important to to hear where you stand, um, and it's good that you emphasize that uh, you this is one party's view, of course, um, mm -hmm. and uh, well. A pro-European party's view, I should ask, uh, perhaps uh, uh, not necessary, I think, um, but for our uh, non-Dutch uh, viewers, perhaps um, good to know. Um, let me turn to Peter Potman then uh, for uh, as a final speaker um, in our panel. Um, Peter is currently Deputy Director General for Foreign Economic Affairs at the Ministry of uh, Foreign Affairs of the Netherlands. Um, before that, um, he was Director for Asia and Oceania. Um, and in that position, I might add, he was the mover and shaker behind uh, the China strategy that the Netherlands put out in uh, 2019. Um, important for everybody here to know. Um, and of course, he has lived and worked in uh, Washington and in Shanghai as Consul General. Um, so who better to invite uh, to this panel than uh, Peter? Thank you uh, for being with us. Um, very looking, quite looking forward to hear your views, Peter. Well, thank you, Maaike. Um, can everybody hear me? That's good. But I was kicked out for a couple of minutes, so I'm, I'm afraid I missed part of uh, uh, Salima's uh, speech. Um, but uh, perhaps, um, well, on the outset, let me let me first of all thank Klingendal uh, and, and you, Maaike and Brigitte, for um, you know, making this possible, having this webinar series, and also having had the bright idea to, uh, to launch the report. Uh, on, on what is uh, an increasingly important topic, um, you know, high-tech uh, cooperation um, and, and including concepts of um, uh, strategic autonomy um, that we're all grappling with. Um, and I, so I would, I would start by saying this is something that is uh, very much um, uh, moving. Um, and so we'll have to see where we come, um, where, where we'll go to, um, certainly with the new administration uh, having come in. Um, it's an important debate because um, it, it refers to geopolitical developments um, and technology, digitalization, um, and th those are the elements that are reshaping our world. So what I will do this afternoon very briefly is um, start with the, this new paradigm because I, I think it is important that we dwell on this for a minute because everything else flows from it. Um, then uh, say a few words about strategic autonomy as we see it and as we are practicing it uh, in the framework of the European Union, and then talked about transatlantic cooperation uh, and focus on technology. Um, so the first thing that I would like to say is that um, you know, this is important um, because uh, our world has changed. So the paradigm has shifted. Um, and so we, we live in a world now um, that is marked um, and characterized, I think, by global competitive engagement. Um, and we come from a world which, by and large, you could say, um, was multilateral cooperation under the Pax Americana. Um, and that has gone. Um, and, and not only courtesy of Mr. Trump, um, but I think because of the shift in, in relative uh, power. Um, and, and that is uh, something that for a country like the Netherlands, but I think Europe at large, um, is very difficult to deal with because in the old system, um, we, we could basically certainly, well, let me speak for the Netherlands. I mean, as a free trading nation, um, we were well off. We were protected by NATO. We had our internal market um, within the EU uh, and uh, through multilateral cooperation, our companies could compete rather than our states would compete. Um, and I think that is, um, that is gone. Um, and so now we are faced uh, with uh, countries that use their economy um, for economic statecraft. And that's not only China, uh, but it is also the United States. Um, and, and that is something um, that I think we have to keep in mind when the EU starts thinking about strategic autonomy. Um, so in that new world, uh, I would say, um, we have to be able to defend our people um, and our companies and our way of life. Um, 
And for that, we need a resilient EU. We realize that the Netherlands as such um, in this world um, is too small uh, to perform those tasks. Um, and so we, we need the EU to, to do this, to safeguard uh, our public interest um, and uh, to keep us economically competitive. Um, and preferably, of course, within a well-functioning uh, global um, system. Um, and we also figured out very swiftly, um, and, and you mentioned uh, my work on the, on the China paper uh, that, the, that the government um, uh, presented um, about two years ago, uh, we have realized that um, in this world, as it takes shape, of course, China is the most dynamic element in that. Um, and we also realized, and this year with the pandemic even more, uh, our growing dependence uh, on China and on many aspects of, of uh, China as a market and China as a provider of goods. Um, and we, we are also acutely aware, uh, as I think uh, all of us, um, also in Australia, um, is that is the Chinese ambition? Um, you know, the 2025 program um, is as well known. I think um, we've come to realize how dependent we are on the 5G technology um, in our telecom operations. Um, we realize how swiftly their market is growing when it comes to semicon, um, and and also how they are um, pushing their standards more and more um, on, onto the global marketplace. Um, and so to deal with that world um, and trying to um, keep our way of life and, and uh, keep our competitiveness, we need maximum transatlantic cooperation. Uh, but with a twist, as I said, because the EU can no longer be the junior partner to the United States, um, uh, which is now one of the geopolitical players. And it's no longer the capo di tutti capi, uh, as the mafia would have it. Um, and that is new, and I think it's also new to the American psyche, um, you know, to deal with a world in which they perhaps are no longer um, the, the absolute number one. Um, for the transatlantic cooperation, it means that the United States will have to accept the EU as a full partner, as Jim was saying, um, and the EU, of course, will have to live up <laughs> to its own ambition to become a global player. Uh, this is what we're saying. Prime Minister Rutte has said it on occasion. Um, the commission president says it, um, but you know, okay, um, those are words. Let's see if we can do it. Um, perhaps a brief word on, in this um, in, uh, relation, um, uh, on what uh, Jim said about the comprehensive agreement on investment. Um, you know, there's a lot of debate whether this was a wise thing to conclude at this point in time. Um, I know that my minister came out very critically in the, in the press, um, and, and my minister happening also to be the political leader of Salima, uh, Salima's party. Um, um, but I think by and large, the EU um, has been negotiating this treaty for many years because we wanted to have this in order to better protect our companies. Um, and at a certain point, um, um, the, the Chinese gave in up to a point where the commission said, well, you know, this is what we try to achieve. We've achieved it. So let's let's make a deal. Um, and we'll have to see um, whether this deal will stand and whether the treaty will come into existence. It's now part of a year long uh, political process within the European Union. And after that, and I fully agree with Jim, uh, the big question is, you know, is China going to hold its part of the deal uh, by living up to a treaty? Um, but for the European Union as such um, to sort of step ahead and say, well, we don't believe this. And so we're not going along with, uh, with the treaty like this, uh, I don't think would be correct. Um, and so let's see what the outcome will, will be there. Um, I think the other element um, where the United States and, and Europe may be, may, may be having a different approach towards China is that um, the US may well see or um, define uh, the competition in terms of a Cold War. Um, and I think that Europeans don't want a Cold War. Um, the Europeans realize that China is going to be the largest economy in the world. It's going to be problematic um, you know, as a competitor, but also as a systemic rival. Uh, but it's there. We have to deal with it. and We can't wish it away. And we don't believe that um, a Cold War approach um, would, would bring um, the benefits to all of us. Now, having said this, um, strategic autonomy, 
for the um, for the EU. The EU should not strive to be a fortress, and I don't think this is what the EU is intending to do. We need um, in this world um, open markets. We need to engage, and we have to prevent protectionist impulses. Um, but we also have to defend ourselves, as I said, against economic statecraft, um, and we have to strengthen our own competitive advantages. And, and Europeans, as Salima was saying, uh, come back from the geopolitical holiday. The Europeans have been lazy in this system because we thought um, you know, that the world is globalized um, and therefore we can depend on Chinese technology and American tech companies um, to do um, you know, the heavy lifting, and then our companies can compete happily ever after. Um, but because the world has changed, we have to change. Um, so uh, ways to achieve this strategic autonomy for the, for the EU include diversification of trading partners. Um, we want a competitive, fair, sustainable, well-functioning internal market that is crucial. Strong competition frameworks, um, foreign direct investment screening uh, is an element of this. Um, and we have to invest in innovation. Um, that is crucial. And the EU has been lagging. Um, and I can say that the EU on all of these accounts is pressing boldly ahead, um, and, um, but we'll have to see where, where we end up. Um, the um, concept of decoupling was mentioned by a couple um, of, of speakers, um, and this may be a direction that we're going, a, a technological decoupling between the US and China. Um, from an EU perspective, this is bad news, um, because again, it does away with uh, the, the gains that we've made in globalization. Um, and we believe that a world of mutual dependencies is a better one uh, through a multilateral system. Um, now, transatlantic cooperation. Um, in this new world, the EU um, is not neutral um, and um, has also clearly indicated it is not neutral in the joint communication of the 2nd of December. Uh, in your own report, you have this um, beautiful triangle uh, where you can see that it's not equidistant. Um, we are much closer to the United States than we will ever be to China. Um, because in the end, our values, ideological disposition, if you will, uh, are far more aligned with the US uh, than with China. We're allies and partners, um, it was mentioned. And so for us, as the EU uh, put it um, in, in its previous strategy, um, is a, you know, China is a partner on some issues, it's a competitor, um, but it's also a systemic rival. Um, and that means um, that transatlantic cooperation is quintessential for our success. Um, and so we want the administration, the new uh, Biden administration, uh, to come back to the multilateral fold um, and, you know, as, a, as a first step, because that is the world order um, that um, we should try to keep and restore as much as possible. Uh, together, I should say, uh, with European and our Asian um, and Australasian uh, allies, uh, obviously, to uphold that order um, and to defend it. Um, and, and Australia, uh, for one, is as like-minded uh, as, as any, I would say, uh, certainly to a country like the Netherlands. Um, very importantly, if this is the outset um, and the Biden administration has just started, um, it's very important, I think, that we should not um, give priority to our bilateral transatlantic uh, disputes um, in, in the period to come. Um, there are many <laughs> stumbling blocks uh, on the road. Uh, but So I think we need a political agreement uh, to work on our differences whilst giving priority uh, to co cooperation encountering the, the, and engaging the China challenge. Uh, and trust me, this will be hard enough, uh, you know, given the, the, the pressures on by American, uh, but also protectionist impulses um, in, within the EU. Um, but it is important because if we start bickering between ourselves, then of course, um, you know, how can we ever uh, confront the China challenge, I should say. Um, now, your report focused on tech, and I'll come to my last couple of remarks. Um, technology, um, in all of this, again, and digitalization, they are fundamentally changing our societies um, and our economies. And, of course, technology has always been the driver of economic and social change, uh, but the confluence, I think, now of 30 years of globalization uh, with this new um, um, you know, iceberg, if you will, of geopolitical competition um, has led to a tech war 
Um, and, and that complicates the calculations uh, of all of us and is also driving the impulse of the EU to, to make up uh, for um, uh, what it's lost in, in previous years. Um, I think a second complication is the dual use character of modern technology, where the distinction between civil and military use um, is becoming increasingly diffuse. Um, and the widespread interference of modern technology um, and sensitive technologies like uh, artificial intelligence, uh, robotics and Internet of Things in our societies also uh, bring um, the relationship between technology, security and economy uh, to the fore. And that means, and it was mentioned by others, the states will have to extend their reach uh, in the realm of sensitive technology, uh, but also in the realm of the economy. Um, and, and so this is, I think, also going to be a big debate uh, after the elections. Uh, does it really play a big role, in my view, in the Dutch elections? But after reforming government, this is going to be uh, an important point of discussion. So in all of this, uh, the EU will have to step up its game. Um, and, um, you know, and, and, and this is how I see and we see the uh, strategic autonomy taking shape. Um, you know, it's just, um, it, it, it is uh, coming, uh, coming up from behind in order to um, better be able uh, to hold, our, um, you know, uh, hold ourselves in, in this new competitive world. Um, then obviously autonomy uh, is a relative concept. Um, fully full autonomy um, is impossible. And I think it was Jim who said it. I mean, it's not how the world and how technology works. Um, but so given the global competition, um, I think we do need, um, and, and we're not allowed to call it a tech alliance, but <laughs> from, the, um, from the idea that, um, you know, as democracies uh, on the values that, that, we, that we have, um, we cannot um, steer clear, I think, from also bringing in the technological debate and innovation um, uh, in, into that perspective. Um, so uh, we have to get together, uh, the European Union, the US, like-minded countries in Asia, uh, to um, have an innovative and a proactive approach uh, towards technology. Um, and we have to build um, and defend our standards. As I said previously, um, we have to collaborate on capturing and nurturing critical new technologies. Um, and we have to create a level playing field uh, with our partners um, where we can drive innovation and where we can also let our companies compete um, in that context. Uh, without uh, being vulnerable uh, to uh, malpractices um, from um, our uh, strategic nemesis. Um, so there's a lot, um, I think, that has to be done on that agenda. Um, let me finish by saying that it doesn't mean that we have to cut off all cooperation with China. Um, it's too big for that, it's too important, um, and I, I don't think it would do well for our world. Uh, but we have to approach this from a position of strength. Um, and that is what we need the transatlantic partnership for. So um, those were my remarks. And I look forward to the questions and the discussion. Thank you so much, uh, Peter. Um, for anybody who still had any doubts uh, whether you, EU strategic autonomy and uh, transatlantic cooperation could go hand in hand, I think here's your answer. Of course, uh, it can. Uh, but with the United States, perhaps as a big brother, as uh, Salima said, but not as a, with the Europe as a junior partner, as Peter said. That's um, interesting to bring those two together. Um, as to questions, I think uh, the, quite a few have been uh, raised in the chat. So I would like to um, turn to Brigitte, who has been uh, looking at those questions more closely than I have to, uh, to put a few to our panelists. Brigitte? Yes, thank you, Maike. Um, I think it was a great debate or great introductions and I'm, uh, I'm eager to react to many points myself, but uh, apparently many people are eager to react. So um, I as a moderator will have to wait and I will first ask those questions um, in the chat or in the Q&A. Um, and one thing what, which was already on my own list, uh, which is quite a challenging statement of Jim, who argued that the EU cannot be a commercial partner with the biggest police state and be an exporter of values that really triggered some, uh, some questions. Um, and I think this is precisely a point, you see the friction between the US and EU thinking uh, and the idea that the US is countering China uh, 
with the U.S. is countering China while the EU is competing with China. Um, so perhaps first a question to Peter, um, and then a question back already for Jim. Um, Peter, would you say, um, well, can the EU be a commercial partner and uh, an exporter of values at the same time? And uh, for Jim, wouldn't you say that the EU, or that the EU is a stronger norm entrepreneur, even if they compete with China, than do business um, and do business with China in the digital domain, um, compared to the US, with the GDPR uh, being quite a leading thing at the moment? Um, and then, then turning for our last question um, on this subject down under, Bart. Um, one of the first questions that came to mind when listening to your introduction was whether you already see other fractions in the relation with China, uh, which may also be addressed by the US and EU in the near future, uh, such as you mentioned the 5G debate. Uh, and Wilhelm Fossa uh, had a question that fits neatly in this, uh, and that is whether there are concrete areas where the EU can work with Australia in the area of high tech, and more specifically, what does Australia expect from the EU and its member states? Um, so I think Peter, then Jim, then Art, if that's okay with you, Micah. Okay, if it's okay with Micah, I'll start. <laughs> I want to be careful. Um, yeah, it, 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 this is an interesting question, and um, uh, I don't know uh, to what extent Jim was uh, trying to to um, you know um, make that argument. But obviously, the EU and the US, I would say, are both commercial partners to Chinese companies. Um, you know, in many realms, this has been developed, and I don't think it's going to go away. And I don't think it would be wise to make this um, make this go away. Um, so it's to some extent, I think it's 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 a word play, and to some extent, you know, this is a real strategic question. Um, so in 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 that sense, um, if you say China is the biggest police state in the world, what are you actually saying? Um, you know, I, I would I would think that China is going to be the largest economy in the world. Um, with a population that travels around the world, and and most people, um, you know, go back to this country, um, and um, I'm not diminishing um, uh, the the criticism that we rightly have on human rights abuses in in China, uh, but to um, to focus on one element of such a large population, state, and economy, um, and making that the argument for a full decoupling and, and um, as I said, uh, a Cold War-like approach that you cannot do anything with a country like this, um, I, I think is going way too far and would be counterproductive um, for, um, for many reasons. Um, so now, can the EU be an exporter of values? Um, I hope so. Um, and, and the same is true for the United States. Uh, I mean, this was one of the great strengths, I think, that the transatlantic uh, alliance um, had um, that you know we uh, by and large um, you know so practiced what we preached um, and and this has become um, more doubtful in recent years and 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 this is uh, I think um, you know has has benefited the uh, the Chinese Communist Party um, who could point out that the West was just saying um, one thing and doing another. Um, so um, I would hope that we can get back <laughs> as a transatlantic community um, in the multilateral sphere, but also in, in, in our approach of, of values to, um, um, to be seen, um, perhaps not by the Chinese leadership, because I don't think they really care, um, but by the population and by, by other countries in the world as a credible uh, democratic alternative um, to um, the attractions of a forceful um, uh, autocratic model. Um, but this is up to us. Um, now, the last element, I think if I understood the question correctly, um, you know, how can you do business in the digital um, realm with a police state. Um, and I think there it becomes more complicated and you see the EU um, and EU countries taking increasingly um, more action <coughs> to limit the exposure uh, that we have um, in the digital realm uh, to uh, large uh, Chinese companies 
or to constructions where uh, our data would flow um, to, uh, to the Chinese state. Um, so, um, I, I, you know, if you, if you look at, um, at that realm, I, I think we will see more decoupling, if you will. Um, and uh, I don't think that is a trend uh, that's going to be reversed anytime soon. Um, but um, as to an overall um, breakdown of, of any commercial relationship between the world and China, I think that would be a bad idea. Thank you, Peter. Over to Jim. Uh, great, thank you. Uh, so first of all, let me say that uh, I found Bard and Peter's remarks uh, really uh, insightful. Uh, Salima said something that I thought was uh, really interesting. She said the winds of nationalism are blowing through the Netherlands. And I hope we have time to come back to that because this is a, a point we've been discussing internally here. How powerful is nationalism now in, in Europe? And the Netherlands is one of the countries we study closely. But a few quick points. Um, uh, first of all, uh, Europeans should realize that the word autonomy is tone deaf, right? I mean, autonomy doesn't mean we're partners. Autonomy means you're independent. So I get what you're saying, I get what you're doing, but when you say autonomy, you know, there's old Charles de Gaulle standing behind you. So think about your presentation. Second, Salima brought up 5G, I think Peter did too. Um, you don't wanna miss the boat again. We don't want you to miss the boat again. 5G is the last technology you need to be thinking about how telecommunications is evolving, right? And it's evolving, I hate to use the word 6G. You can now make fun of me the way I complained about you saying tech, you can say I shouldn't say 6G. Um, this is going to make telecom more like the internet. It will be white box telecom. It will depend on software and semiconductors. So don't hitch your cart to last year's horse. That was a tortured analogy, wasn't it? So. Um, forward looking on 6G, you asked the question about was Brussels an obstacle or an advantage? And this gets to the question of how do we accelerate European innovation? The word that almost always gets left out of these discussions is entrepreneurship. Um, innovation by itself is not enough. So Europe has a very strong innovation base. Uh, I had some French government officials come in last year when we could still visit and ask, we have great universities, we have great researchers, um, but we don't seem to be able to commercialize it. And so the, the secret sauce there is entrepreneurship. Um, I hate to say it, but who is the European Elon Musk? And Elon Musk is a pain in the neck, but you, you need people like that, right? So where is, and that's where Brussels I think has trouble because entrepreneurship means taking risk. It means disrupting existing companies and structures. Someone, I can't remember who brought up the, uh, the fact that the top 20 internet companies are uh, American and Chinese. Um, uh, the statistic I use is that when you look at the 10 uh, wealthiest companies in the US, um, all of them are less than 20 years old. When you look at the 10 wealthiest companies in Europe, all of them are more than a century old, right? That's a very telling statistic. And so are you defending the status quo, which would be 5G, or are you, uh, are you willing to take the risks? And so that's, that's actually what I've been thinking about is how, given Europe's strengths um, and given Europe's importance to the United States, how do we encourage more risk-taking in your financial system, in your innovation system? And that focuses a lot on Brussels, right? And you would know better than I how to answer that question, but it is one of my research topics for the years. Um, uh, on the issue of China, um, we can't decouple from China. I think everyone realizes that. What we, we can't decouple from China now, right? No one in the US wants uh, a Cold War. Uh, we had uh, Bob Gates, the former Secretary of Defense and CIA director speak at CSIS a couple of weeks ago. And he said, look, it's not a cold war. We don't want a cold war. We can't have a cold war, right? The world has changed. It's not the 1980s. So a cold war is out, but there are some fundamental issues. And so one of the problems I think with, 
with your projects and my projects is that we are at the start of a journey. And so we are guessing where the trends will go. I'd remind everyone there are two Canadians in jail who were taken hostage by the Chinese government when uh, Canada arrested at the request of the US, um, a Huawei executive for violating UN sanctions on sales to Iran, right? That's what I worry about is that everything's going swimmingly until they're mad at you. Australia knows this very well. And suddenly you find two innocent citizens in jail for no reason other than taking hostage. Just as an aside, I've encouraged the Canadians to all to take counter hostages. And they say, we can't do that. We're a country that has the rule of law. I was like, oh my God, you know, you can't be Boy Scouts in this fight necessarily. But I think we will be Boy Scouts for a while. And that makes it much harder. Uh, what we, where we are now, I think what Peter said, what Salima said, what Bart said was exactly right. Um, where we will be four years from now uh, will be different. And that's what you might wanna be thinking about both in technology uh, and in terms of China. So I don't think, you know, that's it. These fundamental tensions uh, uh, point to larger trends. And so where we are now vis-a-vis the transatlantic relationship vis-a-vis -vis China uh, will not be where we are some years from now. And so that's looking ahead, that's part of strategy, uh, looking ahead at what the challenges will be. So I don't know how you construct this. This is a good topic. I'm glad you guys are doing this. Uh, we're not going to decouple, um, but we also face an incredible challenge uh, to our values and to fundamental rights. And how do we come up with a solution that balances them? And, I do not think the Americans have the answer. Uh, I would agree with Peter that there's trouble in Washington. Um, I, there's, it's not trouble, but I'd say there's still this implicit assumption that we are the older brother. And so what I've been encouraging people to think is uh, those days are over, <laughs> right? We have, to have, we have to be partners now. And I think the majority of the Biden administration realizes they're not going to just stroll back in as the leader of the free world. We should, another term we should discard, right? So you've touched on a whole set of, of very serious issues. And I think it's good to have these discussions because right now we can say, here's the best solution for the moment, but we know that that solution will not hold for some later point. I'll stop there, thank you. Thank you, Jim. Wise words. Um, Bart, the question's addressed to you. Um. Yeah, thanks, Mike. Th thanks, Vijit, and uh, thanks, for, uh, thanks for those questions. Um, um, I've been listening very carefully to Jim, so I almost forgot about the questions. Um, I think the first question was about, um, um, I, I think I, I definitely wrote it. I'm not sure whether I mentioned it, but it's 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 quite articulated that kind of Australia is at the forefront of whatever the kind of the future relationship between either the US or Europe with, with China will look like. So what 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 are let's say the new potential friction points on the agenda? And um, uh, obviously I can't know for sure, but I think I, I very much follow the line um, um, set by by Jim um, 5G and what comes after. Um, um, across kind of the across the economy um, in the different uh, in the different sectors, um, um, I'm not sure. Let's say to what extent this also applies to some of the other countries, but definitely the Australian government has 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 articulated fairly recently uh, a, a strategy around critical and emerging mostly critical technologies. Um, so so they're really kind of revamping um, their diplomatic efforts in. Uh, around uh, 5G, 6G, um, artificial intelligence, data governance, um, quantum computing, and things like that. So I think looking from a policy perspective, that's, that's definitely where um, some of the, the, the focus will be for the next um, two to three years. The other element, I think, where, where, we, where we see increasing friction is around um, what I would call kind of strategic geoeconomic infrastructure here in the region. So the there is obviously the Belt and Road um, network, which also has uh, a few elements um, in and around Australia. Um, so, so kind of investments around um, submarine communication cables in the Pacific um, is a very uh, current debate at the moment. 
uh, ownership of, uh, of of satellite and telecommunication companies in the region um, is 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 an actual debate whether um, there's one um, one company registered in, in the Caribbean which is called Digicel, which is the, the largest um, uh, so internet and, and telecommunication service provider, and it's 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 set to kind of sell its specific arm. And China Mobile is is uh, allegedly planning to do a takeover bid. And now the question is whether um, the Australian government would uh, would see to step in. Um, so I think that's uh, probably another friction point where we see more activity. Um, when we look at kind of options of where, in particular, kind of the EU and Australia would um, could increase their cooperation, I think this is a very tricky part. But um, there have been numerous attempts at kind of increasing cooperation between the EU and Australia. And I think Mr. Putman mentioned, um, let's say, the like-mindedness of the continent and um, uh, there and the continent here. Um, but in terms of very practical cooperation, tangible results, it's, it's actually pretty hard to, to find concrete evidence uh, beyond uh, kind of the, um, the free trade um, uh, arrangements, which are currently being, being negotiated. Um, but I mean, to mention a few, I think uh, obviously fundamental research is a, is a big part of the current EU-Australia agreement, um, which will also be part of the free trade agreement. Um, but at the same time, I think Australia, and I definitely put it in, in, in the chapter as well, uh, is looking for kind of uh, partnerships in, in parity with, with both the US, both Europe, um, and, um, and, and with universities and, and, and academics in, in China. Um, one area I think where, where I think Canberra would be expecting um, more support from Europe would be around kind of diplomacy and standard setting and kind of in the technical bodies, which lay the foundation for, um, uh, for, for new technologies, but also around let's say, uh, uh, ethical frameworks and, uh, and technical standard setting. Um, vice versa, I think Canberra could learn a lot um, from some of the kind of what the conceptual and strategic debates happening in Europe. So uh, I think the tech autonomy debate in itself is very helpful to kind of articulate and reassess uh, where we are at the moment and kind of which, which choices are in front of us. Um, but also the debate around um, resilience. And I think that was kind of referred to uh, by a few, few, uh, few previous speakers. Um, so I'm not sure, let's say, whether you, you need, uh, I think Mr. Popman mentioned it, a strong partner to, in order to engage with either the US or China, but definitely a, uh, a self-confident and comfortable partner to have that um, technology debate, because whether either Europe and Australia can be as strong as the US and as strong as, as China, um, I, uh, I back to question, and I'm not sure whether that's necessary either. The last point I wanted to make, and I think that's uh, the point that Jim raised as well, um, is that I think there is still the assumption that you can um, talk in different uh, channels of communication with, with Beijing. So you can have a very tough political debate and still do kind of your, your uh, economic collaboration. I think what Australia is experiencing very uh, acutely at the moment is that this kind of separation between kind of political relations, security relations, economic relations, and even social relations can't be separated from one another and are actually definitely in, in Beijing kind of uh, a part of the same package. So uh, let's say a dispute around technical standards could, could, could very easily lead to uh, political repercussions and, and vice versa. So kind of that distinction, um, the government here definitely doesn't see that as, as, as viable um, any longer. Thank you, Bart. Sorry, very sorry. Very final point where I think uh, the EU and Australia could do much more is um, what what some people call kind of the battleground for the future of kind of technology, and that's kind of partners in Southeast Asia. Are we able to uh, support them with uh, material support that that kind of uh, provides encouragement to start entering into the debate uh, and not being subject to either choosing for the kind of the, the US or China, but providing uh, uh, constructive support to, uh, to, let's say, our partners, both from the EU side as from the Australian side in, in Southeast Asia and in South, South Asia. Thanks. Thanks, Bart, for that. Um, the, the forthcoming um, 
EU Indo-Pacific uh, approach, I think it will be, is definitely going to give some, um, some input for that debate, uh, how to work with partners in South Asia, Southeast Asia. Um, and I'm glad that you also brought in a technical standard setting and an attempt to reframe perhaps from strategic autonomy to strategic resilience, which is what I personally much prefer. Um, but um, yeah. I would like, uh, I'm, I'm doing a lousy job here as a, as a moderator, we're running over time, but um, I would like to give the last word to, to Salima, um, not least because Jim addressed her in a specific question on the, the winds of nationalism, um, or perhaps uh, populism, uh, curious to hear your elaboration on that, and perhaps another question that was put in the chat, uh, whether you do not fear that excluding Chinese vendors from the European markets um, will uh, slow down innovative um, development. Perhaps something that you would also like to respond to. Thank you. Yes, I will do. And then I, I will have to keep it short because I'm, uh, I'm, I have to go to another meeting. Um, well, the, it sounds like a really bad rock song, uh, the wind of nationalism or population. I think it's, uh, it's present. Uh, is in different Western countries and democracy, democracies in which we did not expect uh, to happen. I mentioned it especially uh, because it's really difficult uh, from a political sense for me as a politician to talk, to talk even about Europe more than uh, being only critical about things that, that, that don't work well. So um, I've allowed I have had a lot of debates about defense and cooperation, which for me is totally logical to, to unite, to work together, to make common investments. Um, but then you already see how difficult it is. So that's why I made the remark um, for, uh, for the importance for politicians to be aware that we need to convince people that a cooperation is not a way of giving up your sovereignty or your autonomy. It's a way of uh, making sure that you will keep it. And, and that's um, a task for us as a politicians to find the right words to explain and convince people why, uh, why this is important for, for everybody. Um, so that's what I wanted to, to remark, uh, make a remark, uh, make a last remark about, of course, it's interesting to have an open market so you can also use uh, uh, innovation and technology from other companies but I hope I made, I try to make clear that it's also important uh, in a certain area to protect yourself where it's necessary. Um, and um, I think if you invest enough as Europe, uh, then you have a more way, a more easy way to uh, open up for, for ventures. If you do not, you will be eaten up, you could say. Thank you. Thank you, Salima. And I do believe that it's part of an ongoing effort uh, in the Dutch government of identifying what are our strategic sectors and what is, are the elements that we have to protect um, and, uh, and where not, where can we uh, remain open indeed. Um, so with that, I'm afraid um, I will have to close this uh, very inspiring debate. Um, thank you very much uh, to Jim in Washington, uh, Peter and Salima in The Hague and, and Bart in Australia. Um, thank you all for, for being with us here and for everybody who's still with us uh, online. I do hope that you will be able to join us uh, for our next webinar in our series on the 23rd of March, when we have uh, input from Germany, uh, from uh, the United States and from India um, in the next um, webinar in our series. So have a great day um, and see you again. Bye bye.